Look at my belly button, my belly button. Look at my belly button, my belly button. Look at my belly button, my belly button. I'm blowed up. When there is darkness bearing a mountain of pure defeat, the focus still maintains all visibility. My pupils gain x-ray vision, where I see the victory behind any obstacle. Leaving in my rear a trail of debacle and despair. Destruction runs in my veins. Triumph pumps in my heart on repeat. I rise to every occasion and challenge laid at my feet. Someone should have fucking told you. I am who I am. Your ass has been warned. Beware. I get stronger every time I struggle. Through the pain, maintain my hustle. So I call my own pieces to the puzzle. While I learn my way around the jungle, made it through It's so old, they only have like, uh, like parts of the footage from it. So you can see us in the in the front row right here. That's me screaming <laughs> at Bob Backlund to stop choking the one, two, three kid uh, right there. <laughs> the, the, I am about to cry because I'm so upset. And then like my brother and my sister was there. My name is Frank Galino. I'm uh, Mike's older brother. Was there ever a time when you knew he was going to become a wrestler? Yeah, we'd, uh, we'd pray, uh, play wrestle on the side of the yard or in the backyard or on a trampoline. Uh, eventually, he got a lot bigger than me, so I stopped doing that. So. <laughs> you were afraid he was going to kill you? Or what? Oh, I just couldn't do anything to him. Couldn't pick him up. <laughs> uh, he, he started hitting harder than me, so that was the end of that. Um, I'm Becca, Mike's baby sister, the baby of the family. Did you say that they ever, like, piled up on you or, like, kind of throw you around or anything like that cause since you were the girl of the family? Yeah, um, I was definitely the easiest one to practice wrestling moves on. Um, they would wrestle each other, but Mike would see something on TV. He's like, I want to try this. And I'm like, no, it's going to hurt. It's like, no, it won't. I, I can do it. I can do it. Just let me just let me try this. And then he was usually like a body slam onto the mattress or a pile driver into a bunch of pillows. All right, I'm Joe Galino, and I'm Michael's father. When he, when he told you that's what he was going to do with his life, what, you, what was your reaction? I told him go out and get what he can. I really did. Uh, a lot of times you want to do things in your life, but life changes and you got to do what you have to do. I always wanted to study art. I actually wanted, when I was growing up, actually live in New York City and be an artist. But I didn't. And uh, when he told me this is what he wanted to try and do, I said, go try it. The worst thing in life you can do is say you should have. If you try it and you feel that's fail, that's fine. But if you never try, that's the worst regret you can have. Uh, Billy Brash, I've known uh, Coach Mikey for 11, 12 years now, maybe yeah. longer, maybe more. I just dated by the WrestleMania, so yeah. it's 25. Yeah, it was like the weekend before. Yeah. So. Uh, we both have friends that were in the music scene, in our local music scene, and I hadn't seen any of them in years, and just randomly decided to go catch a show, and they had a house party afterwards. So uh, I'm standing in the kitchen, and I hear a group of people, which was Mikey and two of our other friends, standing in the living room, they're talking about wrestling, and I was like, hold up, like, these dudes talking about wrestling? So I literally put my head around the corner, I was like, hey, that's all my wrestling. <laughs> and then uh, it was like we were instant friends from then. Like we spent the whole rest of the night just bullshitting and hanging out. And then literally like the rest is all history from there. I wouldn't be wrestling without him. He wouldn't be in wrestling without me. It's just, it's a crazy, crazy story. So I was just hanging out on his couch and I was just rolling through Facebook and I found uh, Flatline Pro Wrestling was, it was like their return show. And so I hit up uh, Chris Wiggins and I was like, hey man, uh, I'm in town, I'm doing nothing. Can you use me? And he was like, yeah, come on. And I was like, okay, cool, I'm bringing a manager. And he's like, oh, no, we'll talk about it. I was like, no, nah, like, I'm, I'm bringing a manager. <laughs> so, like, I got off the phone with him, and then I looked at Mikey, and I was like, hey, uh, you got some shit to wear tonight? And he's like, yeah, what are you talking about? And I was like, you're going to be my manager. And then we literally went, picked that outfit out of his closet, and that was it. Like, he came in, and he 
killed it right off the bat. Like we had such good chemistry. Like we knew we would, and he played the part. He knew exactly when to get the crowd involved, when to just fade into the background and let the the action speak for itself. And for a while there, I couldn't get back to flat line, and they kept they like Mikey was trying to get on with them, and they kept being like, "Hey, we want to keep Mikey with you." And I was like, "I'm just not available." Like you, you gotta let him do his thing. Like he's he's good. Let him do his thing. And that's how the the Galino family got started, right? Yeah. Talk to me about the uh, your uh, your first your first official character. So um, I always always kind of felt like I needed to pay uh, tribute to my my family. I know with the the pale skin and the blonde hair and the red beard, you can tell that I'm almost full blood Italian, right? And uh, uh, but no, I wanted to do an Italian character. And I always, I always felt like I could do like the, you know, mobster Italian voice and talk like this. And you know what? It's my interview. I got something to say to each and every one of you watching right now. I am not like you. I'm not a wrestling fan. I am, however, a fan of money. And when my clients wrestle, I get money. But you see, when my clients don't wrestle, I lose money. I'm originally from New Jersey, so I felt like I could always relate to something like that. And really, I just mimicked my dad. When they started doing that, me and him started yelling it. So the referee would go, two, and we go, two. And <laughs> that's where the character kind of stemmed from. I was just listening to the way my dad talked. And I was like, oh, I can do it like this mobster character. And no one really told me, you know, that's, you don't really look like a mobster, you know? No, no, I understand. No, no, you don't raise your voice to me. You came to us. You came to us and you want the job done. But understand that when you say out of commission, the Galeno family is going to take them out of commission. I remember setting up everything and, um, um, backstory to it, um, my mom, she, she has COPD, uh, congestive heart failure, portable defibrillator. She had really bad heart problems and she was in and out of the hospital for the, probably the past five years prior. And I would get, I would get a lot of calls, uh, about her being in the hospital and a lot of times we'd go there and she would get a bunch of tests and she'd be okay and they'd send her home. And it was either uh, me, my brother, and my sister would get the calls and we would we would go out there to her. And um, so it wasn't it wasn't uncommon for any of us to call each other. We've always been really close, me, my brother, and my sister. But if it was about mom, we kind of all figured we needed to be in the hospital for her. Uh, but I was setting up, I was at the show, setting up the ring, and I remember being what they call the, I was right where they call the, kind of the gorilla position, or right by the curtain, uh, where the curtain would be, we were still setting up, but my brother had called me and I picked up the phone, and uh, he, um, the first thing he said, he was like, uh, Mike, are you driving? And that was such a weird question for me, but somehow I knew that I didn't, I knew it was next. And he said, Mom died. And I. I I didn't know what to say next after that. Um, he didn't say much. He didn't know much. Uh, and I was, I was out of there. You know, I, I, I remember going up to the promoter and, uh, just, it's, it sounded so casual for me to, when it came out of my mouth and it almost sounded like on real, but I was like, Hey, I got, I, I gotta go home. My mom died. And then I, 
his jaw just dropped and because it's it came out so casual because it, well, I was in shock and I remember um at the time we were friends we uh we were getting to know each other but Ethan Case uh was there and I remember I just walking back to the uh, you know I was walking to the locker room and I was grabbing my bags and I, w- I wasn't feeling anything. It was just, I was so numb to what I just heard. You know, my mom was my best friend, you know, and she would meet, we were very close. And um, I remember her, you know, him, Ethan meeting me in the locker room and he grabbed me and just hugged me. And I, that's when it kind of fell out of me. And I just started bawling my eyes out in this locker room that I had all these great memories and all these, these moments. And now now was like the worst place that I've ever been. So it was just me and my brother and my sister. And we had went over the corner. Uh, they said she had a massive heart attack and it's, it still blows my mind because this was the, every time that she would go through something like this, she would call one of us this time. She didn't. She had called nine one one, but they were too late, and that's that's something that always kind of sticks with me. But you know, through it all, what's you know, the last time I got to see her was that day before, and it's so crazy to me because you don't you don't you don't remember every day you get to see your family members, but you, when something like that happens, you remember the last day you got to see them. And, uh, I'll never forget She, she came up to my work for something and I remember she went to go drive away and I remember ask, I remember I had something to ask her. I couldn't remember what it was, but I remember I was like, oh, I'll just see her tomorrow. And that was, that was it. But I, I got to hug her and I got to tell her I loved her. And that's something we always did. You know, that was something we always, we always never forgot to do was, Anytime we left each other, even when we're angry at each other, people would laugh at us, but we would say, I love you. At the time, you know, I was, I was just doing these small shows. You know, I remember doing a show in a parking lot in front of a video game store. I think there was five people in the crowd and that's including like the wrestlers families. So I wasn't doing a lot and I I didn't care, you know, like never had ambition to do more. You know, I had this job that I was working at. It was full time. It was okay money. And I was like, all right, here it is. The very last show at Flatline, we went out to eat though. And I remember talking with Rob and he, I remember him saying to me, he said, you know, Hey, uh, we're starting this thing at PWX in North Carolina. And, you know, I know this is ending over here, but you know, you should come out and you should manage us out there. And I say, it's me, a guy named Lance Lude and Colby Carino, which was Steve Carino's son. And I was like, whoa. I was like, okay. Yeah, I'll think about it. talking to Ethan and he said you need to you need to cut a promo as their manager I was like oh, well I'm not their manager he goes exactly that's what the promo's about and I talked with Rob and Lance and Colby and they were they had this idea called the ugly ducklings and uh they they were like wouldn't it be cool if we had like a coach Bombay you know like the mighty ducks and I was like yeah that'd be really cool but like me as Coach Bombay, because I'm the the character itself was almost this delirious character that was so delirious that he didn't understand that he wasn't their coach. Like it was just almost like a super fan, you know. And um, it was funny to me because where it came from was almost like the struggles that I've been through this past year was 
and I was almost poking fun out of it and it was therapeutic for me and it still is therapeutic for me to act like that because it was poking not so much poking fun at but it was it was making light of something that was so tough for me to go through and that was helping me get through it do you feel do you feel like it was the universe kind of brought you guys together in a weird way like it was almost meant to be um i'm not i'm i'm not a real big believer in the universe kind of bringing things together or fate as people call it Mm -hmm. um because i I truly believe we make our own fate you know we we carve our own paths in this world i was going down a very dark one and i would i'll if i waited on fate to bring me out of that i don't know if i would be here you know i would i would say it would took a lot of support and love and most importantly, that was support and love for myself. That was the biggest thing for me. Once I got that back, everything kind of came natural again. Everything felt normal again. And uh, for me to be up there, I think it was it once once I understood that I deserved it, and they understood that they deserved it. Once we all felt like we're on the same page, and we all had that, me, Rob, and Lance, and Colby, we all had that little chip on our shoulders. That was what we ran with because people our entire lives told us no, but we didn't take that as an answer. We didn't take that, you know, here was Lance. That's one of the smallest guys in the ring getting told no Rob, which people, people look at Rob, you know, he's missing teeth and straggly beard and people tell him no. As, as quickly as everything crumbled around me was as quickly as it rebuilt. And it rebuilt. And it rebuilt. So you give, you give me this much and we're going to blow the doors off. 